and welcome to the Occlusal Sprints Diagnosis, Fabrication, and Treatment webinar. It is being presented by our very own Dennis Urban CDT, and we will begin shortly. And now to introduce Dennis Urban CDT. He brings 40 plus years of dental technology field experience, including lab management, technical training, sales and marketing, product development, and quality assurance. In addition to being a seasoned, seasoned dental lab manager, Dennis has been an eminent lecturer worldwide since 1985. His lectures and courses span many areas of dental technology, including denture setups, digital technology, denture processing, lab management, implant overdentures, and bar design protocol, all on four, and six, case planning and chair side conversions, shade communication, occlusion, and soft liners. His technical articles have been published in publications across the US, Canada, and Europe. Dennis Urban has been president of both the Long Island Dental Laboratory Association and the Dental Laboratory Association in the state of New York. He has served as a Cal Lab board member and is the current board president on the National Board of Certification and serves on the advisory board for IDT Magazine. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's presenter, Dennis Urban, CDT. Take right. it away, Dennis. Thank you, Jessica. I hope everybody can hear me all right. I'm, 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 I'm uh, presenting this remotely at a hotel and the bandwidth isn't that great, which unfortunately, so Jessica, if we happen to, happen to uh, get off the presentation here, just send me the text so I know we're not connected anymore. But um, all righty, so, uh, but good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. And uh, I see we have a lot of participants tonight, you know, and um, so tonight is gonna be a really interesting uh, presentation on uh, occlusal splints. And one of the most important joints in the human body is the temporomandibular joint. And that connect, connects the skull to the jaw. And it's also one of the most problematic joints due to TMJ disorder or TMJD. And TMJ disorder results in pain, tenderness, swelling, and other symptoms around the face and jaw. And TMJ disorders are fairly common. It's a common uh, symptom. And it's it, depending on the severity of the pain and discomfort that a patient is experiencing, it, it can also be fairly easy to treat and manage. But the treatment of occlusal related disorders is often a challenge for both the dentist and the patient. And these disorders are often dis difficult to diagnose as the presenting symptoms can be variable. So occlusal splint design and function can be considered an example of the art and science of dentistry and dental technology. And once the cause of occlusal related disorders is identified, there is reversible non-invasive therapy provides both diagnostic information and relief without the problems that often accompany other approaches to care and that is surgery and extended drug therapy. So let's get started here. I'm gonna see if we can get my presentation going here. Diagnosis, fabrication, and treatment. And here's the little outline of the webinar. We have a lot to cover in an hour here, and there's a lot of text and a lot of discussion. So we're gonna talk about examination and diagnosis, TMJ pain, centric relation, appliance types, fabrication. We'll talk about digital versus traditional methods, material science, patient acceptance, and goals and predictability. So what is occlusal splint therapy? So let's start with a quote here from Inside Dentistry. Occlusal splint therapy may be defined as the art and science of establishing a neuromuscular harmony in the masticatory system by creating a mechanical disadvantage for, for parafunctional forces with removable appliances. And a properly constructed splint facilitates a mutually protected occlusion. So, we look at the FAQs or frequently asked questions on occlusal splint therapy, and we're gonna talk about that in a second, but what type of splints are available and how do these splints work? And which type of splints should we be used and, and when? And how often should splints be adjusted? And we'll touch on all of that tonight. So occlusal therapy 101, we, some of the terms are for bite splints are mouth guards, bite guards, bite plates. There's hard splints, soft splints, combination of splints, full arch coverage, coverage of several teeth for TMJ disorder or protection of natural dentition on newly restored restorations. So there's a lot to choose from. It can be very, you know, very challenging sometimes uh, in prescribing these types of splints or what, what deciding which splint to, uh, to prescribe. And there are stabilization splints, and we'll talk about this in depth towards the end of the presentation too. And the stabilization splints, they prevent teeth from grinding and clenching. And splint coverage on all, the, or on all of the teeth and typically just worn at night. And repositioning splints that are designed to correct occlusion and they're typically worn all day, every day. So how does splint therapy resolve issues? Well, 
Splints allow ligaments and muscles to relax, and it prevents the jaw reactions such as grinding and clenching. And it also eliminates pain and discomfort, which is most prevalent in these types of situations. And it helps bring occlusion into a more optimal, optimal position and it offsets on the negative effects of bruxism. And the signs and symptoms of unhealthy occlusion is wear, fracture or chipping of teeth. And this is pretty obvious. Uh, and sensitive crevices on teeth or gums and gum and bone recession and losing or shifting of teeth. So they can be pretty detrimental, some of the effects. And more of the signs and symptoms of unhealthy occlusion is the worsening of periodontal disease, damage to dental bridges and implants, tender muscles, headaches, and noises when you open and close your jaw. And I know um, my wife has that. I had problems in the past with that. And it was, they were resolved with, with appliances. And occlusal forces can equal up to 500 pounds per square inch. And it's amazing because, you know, we, I take this into consideration also when I'm making appliances or implant dentures or uh, full mouth reconstruction cases. Uh, and I want to make sure I use the right materials that are going to hold up to those 500 pounds of square, per square inch because those occlusal forces are very heavy and uh, you really have to, uh, to diagnose and treat in the right way. So when your jaw, jaw is closed, your teeth should come together evenly and at the same time without any tooth or teeth touching before one another. And when they don't touch evenly, this puts stress on your teeth and the supporting bone, jaw joints and muscles and clenching or grinding can magnify this problem. So we're starting a little bit with the basics here and we'll get into more of the advanced here, but let's look at some of the symptoms. We have headaches, dizziness, aching pain in around your ear, sharp facial pain, joint locking or popping, deep ear pain, facial swelling, pain or tenderness in the cheek and jaw, and neck and upper back, muscle spasms and pain, and difficulty chewing and with pain. So this, this really puts us in a, in a miserable state when we cannot have the right appliance to, to, to take care of these symptoms. You know, So a lot of patients suffer with this and it's very common. So what are the concerns? Well, the type of appliance, like I mentioned earlier, there are so many appliances out there. We have to make sure that we diagnose and treat with the right type of appliance and the right design. Should we be a flat plane? Should we have cusp of disclusion? Should we have just anterior guidance? Should we have just an, uh, an appliance that just covers the, the two or four anterior teeth? We'll talk about that in a little while. The length of treatment is a concern. Expected results and patient acceptance. So it's really important that patients really comply with what you're diagnosing and treating them for. And, uh, and it just includes patient acceptance. So the expected results with these types of treatments are decreased pain, increased TMJ range of motion, better occlusal efficiency, ongoing increased improvement, and a splint design with quality material. So there are a lot of materials, like I mentioned there earlier, and we're going to go through some of these materials a little later on, but you want to have a splint design with a quality material. You don't want to give a really bad brux or something that's going to be soft and going to bite through in a matter of weeks. Uh, so it's really important to give them the, the right materials. We want to protect that TMJ from dysfunctional forces and stop the possibility of perforations or displacement and create a sta stable, balanced occlusion and create harmonious relationships of all muscles, discs, ligaments, and bones. So this uh, next uh, this information I'm going to talk about next was written in an IDT article last year from Dr. Leonard Hess, which is a, who's a senior faculty of the Dawson Academy. And Dawson really has a nail when it comes to uh, uh, splint therapy. So one of the, some of the things you, you're looking at uh, when you, you're getting a patient ready for uh, splint therapy is we have to check the oral, medical, and dental history of the patient. Evaluate the range of motion on that patient. Centriculation load tests are, are, are necessary. The evaluation of dentition wear and a CBCT or MRI if necessary. And I, I recommend this for every case uh, and just to evaluate and treat, the, and treat these patients. So let's look at the analysis of discs and ligaments. So the discs is, is, the disc is a cushion that separates the lower jaw. And I know a lot of us know this already, but I like to talk about the basics. And it's from the skull base. And ligaments help to tether the disc to the mandibular condyle. And we have two ligaments. One's close to the skin, that's the lateral collateral ligament. And the other is located in a deep part of the joint or the medial collateral ligament. And I'll show you a picture of this in a, in a second here. 
So here you see the, the, the disc and the two ligaments here. So one or both collateral ligaments may be injured in one or both joints. So this is what makes it difficult. And trauma or disease can cause any combination of collateral ligament stretching or tearing. And the result of a ligament stretching or tearing is that the disc may or may not dislocate or herniate in that part of the joint with the ligament damage. So I know it's a lot, it's a mouthful here, but that is one of the reasons why TMJ damage, TMJ damage can vary from one patient to the other. So let's talk about disc herniation. A CT or MRI is advised to diagnose that herniation. And TMJs may be quiet or they may click or pop, or they may have crepitus or sandpaper sounds. In a normal TMJ, the condyle can move forward, away from the ear or backward towards the ear. But if the disc is not herniated, then the joint should not make any sounds as the jaw is opened. And if a ligament stretching allows the disc to herniate, it will slip out of place when the jaw is closed. And when the jaw opens, a snapping or clicking sound usually represents a reduction of the condyle beneath the disc. Upon closing, the condyle typically slips off the disc again and the pop may be heard upon closure. So with that in mind, let's look at some of the appliance choices are, that are out there. And we have a lot to choose from. I don't have all of them listed here tonight. Uh, the first one is, is the Gelb appliance. And that has to be one of the most popular appliances, especially since I've been in, uh, in the laboratory industry. Uh, we used to make a ton of these Gelb appliances in the laboratory and it, it, they work well. They solve the problem and they're a great appliance. And then you have uh, the NTI appliance. We're going to get into elaborate on what these do and why they're and what, what the function is on all of these. And the flat plane appliance. When I first started making the Clusal splints, that's all I made was were flat plane appliances. And over the years, going to courses and learning more about occlusal splints, then I started use, utilizing custom to exclusion um, and those types of uh, uh, NTI appliances, GELB appliances, and looking at what the patient's problems are were and collaborating with our doctors and coming up with a solution. Then we have a relaxer splint. And as I mentioned, we're gonna elaborate on these. And the newest one is the key splint soft clear, which is a really nice material. And that's, that's a CAD CAM material. And it's designed with uh, uh, a special software and it's printed. And then we have the anterior guidance splint. And this is one I wear at night. And this is a picture of my mouth here. I'll show you a larger picture in a little while. But let's elaborate more on these, on these appliance type, types that I just mentioned. So the relaxer splint, it's a custom fit anti-clenching device that provides relief from migraine headaches and jaw disorders. And sometimes we put a little uh, anterior ramp on uh, between the two centrals, and this helps that anti-clenching uh, device provide relief for the patient. And hard acrylic splint appliances, we make a number of these. You know, now what I do with these type of appliances, I'll actually, and I'll show you the technique later on, I'll actually remount the inside of the hard appliance and put a special liner inside to make it more comfortable for the patient. But these splints have a hard acrylic surface and they protect the teeth of heavy, heavy brushes and grinders. I'm just gonna, okay, oops, excuse me one second here. I got here we go. So Bruxies and Remedies splint appliances, these splints relieve patients' stress, stress and bruxism. They also help, help protect the investment of cosmetic restoration. So we prescribe, we tell the doctors, and you know, we ask the doctors to uh, you know, at least have us make a Bruxies appliance uh, to protect those, uh, that you know, if the patient spent a lot of money on um, full mouth reconstruction, whether it be anterior restorations or full mouth reconstruction, we want to protect those, those, uh, that, those restorations. And a Bruxies appliance can do that. And it's made up of a heat cured elasticized acrylic. Pretty much what I have at my, my appliance is a heat cured elasticized acrylic. And the Remedies is a hybrid type of material made out of a heat cured acrylic for heavy Bruxies. So that's a totally hard uh, appliance. And then you have the key splint soft clear appliance. And, and uh, you know, Jessica, who was on earlier, she has one of these appliances and she's very happy with it. And this is a 3D printable material and has the comfort and flexibility of a soft splint with accuracy, accuracy and strength. And we'll talk about the designs on these a, a little bit later. Then you have the Geld appliance. And this is applied, probably made thousands of these appliances over the years in the laboratory. And as you can see here, you have a lingual bar. We have uh, coverage on the posterior region. And I'll, I would usually put about two ball clasps from there between the uh, bicuspids and between the molars. These show three ball clasps, but you know, if the tooth is not really undercut, you probably need another extra, an extra ball clasp on here. But it's pretty much a posterior splint 
covering the occlusal surfaces of the mandible, and it offers the patient less discomfort compared to other splints. And the Gelbel appliance for mandibular orthopedic repositioning is one of the most popular daytime TMJ appliances in the world. And the Gelbel appliance has shown to in evidence-based dentistry research to treat temporal mandibular joint dis displacement, headaches, and sleep disorders effectively. So this is still quite a, po po a popular appliance in the industry. So, and there's a picture of the Gelbel appliance. I, I didn't make these as, as, as open as you can see here. I didn't open the bite as much as you see here, probably maybe about two millimeters less. And uh, this is a special case where we had to raise the, uh, the open the bite a little bit more for the comfort of the patient. But this is the Gelbel appliance. And this only shows two ball clasps between the, I think it's between the cuspid and the bite cuspid here, or the two bite cuspids actually, uh, and that uh, instead of four or six clasps. So as far as the Comfort HS splint appliance, it's a hard soft bite uh, appliance, and it's probably one of the most prescribed appliances due to its comfort and fit. And it has two layers that make up the hard soft splint of each splint, and this each splint is made with a standard flat occlusal plane and slight opposing cuspal inclination. But you can design these with cuspal, uh, cuspid disclusion, uh, and you can design it any way you want for, for the comfort of the patient and for the total outcome, what you're looking for the outcome that uh, that final uh, therapy. So, and these and, and anti eye appliance, this is a very popular appliance. As you can see here, it only covers the two centrals on the upper and has a little bit of a ramp. And this is called a nociceptive trigeminal inhibition tension suppression system. That's a, that's a mouthful, also. Well, the anti eye TSS system. And it's a small plastic device that is originally designed to prevent headache and migraine caused by teeth clenching and grinding. And the objective of the NCI was to relax the muscles involved in clenching and teeth grinding. And this device is an anterior bite stop worn over the two front teeth at night to prevent contact of the canines and molars. And it's designed also to be a deprogramming device. And it cannot be worn for more than six to eight hours a day without the risk of tooth drift drifting or eruption. Any NTI device helps the elevator muscles shut down at, at around 70 to 80%, which is amazing. And that's when the posterior teeth are not touching. And this can greatly reduce inflammation. So this is an excellent uh, device also. It's very small and it's, uh, patient acceptance has been very good. And then you have the dual arch bite splints. And you know we don't make a lot of these, but every once in a while we have to make the dual arch bite splints. And this is a long-term deprogrammer to be worn more than eight hours a day. And there's no contact on the posterior region. And flat occlusal splints, like I mentioned earlier, this was one of the most popular uh, splints out, out on the market. But, you know, I think it was mis, uh, misrepresented because I, th I don't think it should have been um, diagnosed or and, and made for uh, a lot of these uh, patients who really needed a different type of splint. Whether they had occlusal problems, maybe they needed cuspal disclusion. I think they needed more extensive ther therapy. But years ago, this all you had was these flat, flat occlusal splints, and there weren't, wasn't much to choose by uh, choose from. And these are flat occlusal splints. They're, they're relaxation or stabilizing splints. They're in widespread use, and, and they provide even occlusal contacts. And these may be constructed on the upper or lower jaw. And the occlusal thickness of the splint has been addressed in studies. And one of the studies is man's study, and it showed that splints that increased vertical dimension 4.4 millimeters and up to 8.2 millimeters were more effective in producing muscle, muscular relaxation in patients with bruxism and myofascial pain dysfunction in patients than one millimeter splint. So I probably used to, I used to make these maybe one to three millimeters. I never really made them four millimeters to eight millimeters, but the studies of man studies show that it helped uh, it with effectiveness in producing muscle relaxation when the, the, uh, they, they, were, they were thicker. And studies suggest that a minimum of four millimeters increase the vertical and increase in vertical dimension is necessary to protect protect bruxing, bruxing patients. And if a patient is wearing a splint that four millimeters in thickness and still experiences muscle muscular soreness, headache, and or facial muscle muscle tightness immediately after waking, then the splint thickness should be increased and incrementally until symptoms disappear. So a lot of times you'll see, even like this photo on the bottom here, you see how thick that splint is? And this was incrementally added to with, with a, a type of acrylic that bonded to the original splint. And this is my splint here. This is what I utilize. This is my mouth. And uh, this has been worked very well for me. I wasn't that extreme. I did grind at night and it was discomfort when my jaw, my TMJ was sore. And this helped me. I had canine guidance and uh, cuspid disclusion. And we'll talk about this material in a little while, but this was very effective. And this is that almost like uh, a little bit flexible material, but it also holds up and for bad bruxures also. 
And how did I make this? Well, when I fabricated this guy to splint, and now you can do this uh, actually with CAD CAM, but what I used to do, it took a lot of time. And you know, we got to the point in one of the laboratories I was managing, we were doing anywhere from 50 to 75 a day with these guided splints. So what we had to do is duplicate the working model. Then we articulated it using a semi or fully adjustable articulator. So we wanted to make sure, you know, going through different uh, lateral excursions that we were accurate with these excursions. And then what I did, I applied base plate wax or contour wax to achieve canine guidance. And this can be achieved by utilizing the articulator for lateral and protrusive excursions. And that was all done in the wax. And after the splint was wax, I added sprues and I put it on, I put on, uh, on the posterior region, I put sprues. I covered everything with silicone putty, including the sprues. And you can also do this in an investment type method by putting into a flask, but this was a, this make, made it a little bit easier. And after the putty was set, I removed all the wax, painted separate on the model, I mixed this Astron clear splint acrylic uh, with, that I talked about earlier, and we'll elaborate on that in a little while, and I cured it in a pressure pot. And right after it was cured, I put this back on the articulator and made sure that the bite didn't change. And I, spot, I spot grinded it in for canine guidance. I finished and polished it. And the feedback we got on these appliances was amazing. Was amazing. You know, it really helped in therapy with these patients who were anywhere from moderate to severe. Uh, with TMJ problems. And even with me, it worked out great, you know? So, uh, and we'll talk about the CAD CAM aspect of it in a little while. And there's the cusp of disclusion that you see on these types of appliances. So the adjustments, I don't have time to go into all the adjustments today. I'm gonna to add that into my presentation when we do maybe a two hour presentation, but splint adjustments will be required with some weekly and some monthly. It's really important not to just put it in the patient's mouth and send them home and never see them again. You know, really wanna just monitor these adjustments, especially with patients who have problems with occlusion. And in some severe case, cases, as much as twice a week, and it depends on how quickly your discs move and how you try, try, try to fully recenter that TMJ and wearing a splint as prescribed. Make sure the patient follows the, the pres prescription and what they're supposed to do, and they have to accept what you have to tell them to do because otherwise it's not gonna be successful. And wearing that splint at night and, and while you sleep is important. And after several splint adjust adjustments, a rel relatively stable, healthy, reproducible hinge position of the jaw occurs. And some of the underlying issues, after stabilization of the jaw is achieved, it is then time to correct the underlying occlusal issues if there are occlusal issues. And if this is not addressed, occlusal abnormalities originally present will negate any progress already made with the splint therapy. So if you don't address this, you're gonna go back to, to square one and you're gonna have to start all over again. So it's really important to address these issues and, uh, and address the occlusal ab abnormalities after the treatment. So in the beginning of the presentation, I talked about stabilization splints, and they are splints that are effective in the management of TMJ arthralgia. And arthralgia is a term used for TMJ pain caused by capsulitis or synovitis, uh, and it's an inflammatory condition which of the articular capsule and soft tissues that surround the TMJ, much like we showed before in the beginning of the presentation. So to avoid occlusal changes, all patients with any appliances must be instructed not to wear it all time, at all times. And additionally, like I'm going to harp on this, it must be regularly checked and repaired if need be. Especially in those areas where on the posterior regions, when the patient bit bits through that molar, molar region, want to make sure it's repaired and added to. And there have been cases where splints have fractured in the area of the last molars. And this happens, I see this a lot, you know, and I was guilty of this when I was first starting to make these splints because I would make them a little too thin in that molar region. And I learned over the years that, you know, we have to, you know, we have to make that a little bit thicker here. And if we let that happen and it's the thinnest part and it fractures, we have allowed the selective over eruption of these teeth possibly, therefore causing an interior open bite. So stabilization splint therapy may be beneficial for reducing pain severity at rest and on palpation and depression when compared to no treatment at all. So a major advantage to occlusal appliance therapy is a treatment is that the treatment is reversible and non-invasive and the dentist must carefully adjust the appliance. And we're gonna review a little bit as we go along here, but an occlusal appliance is also referred to as a bite guard or bite splint, like I mentioned earlier, and it's custom fabricated with hard or soft acrylic. And you know, this design must utilize anterior condylar guidance to ensure its exclusion. That's what I, what I believe in. And 
All the posterior teeth are in protrusive, excursive, and parafunctional mandibular movements, especially with complex restorative procedures, you know, including change of occlusal vertical dimension or jaw position. Let's talk about repositioning splints now. And this is, you know, repositioning splints are used when, you know, we have deep bite correction. So it's currently repositioning splints are the most popular appliance for deep bite correction. And these appliances load the incisors for intrusive, intrusive effect, but leave the posterior teeth free to erupt, therefore leveling the curve of speed primarily by posterior extrusion. So studies that involve the vertical changes of molars and incisors with bite plane treatment found that alveo the alveoli height in the molar region increased with minimal change in the incisal area and the intrusive effect on the incisors is at best minimal. So repositioning splints consist of an acrylic platform anchored to the maxillary dentition with arrowhead or Adams or ball end clasp or crib clasp. And you know, sometimes I don't use any clasp at all because if we have a good undercut on a tooth, it'll, the retention rate is very good. So anteriorly, a labial bow helps to stabilize the bite plate and contact the teeth and at the incisal one third, much like that appliance I just showed you that I was wearing. And by acting as a premature incisal stop, usually within the confines of the intraocclusal space, the block forces the posterior teeth from occlusal contact and allows them to erupt. But it's advisable not to disclude the posterior teeth by more than two millimeters at this, with these appliances. This allows a close supervision of the follow-up and treatment process and prevents any sudden TMJ or myofunctional change. So wearing appropriate bite splints at night, well, it prevents teeth wearing, like I mentioned earlier. The balance, support, and release tension of the jaw joints, cranial bones, and muscles of the head and neck. And to open up the bite and create more space for your tongue and increase tongue volume. And it also improves energy flow throughout the bottle body, especially helpful during sleep to improve airway and breathing and facilitate a refreshing night's sleep. It reduces clenching and grinding to reduce headaches, neck aches, and jaw aches. And you know, we've even gone as far as making bite splints for indentulous, fully indentulous patients and patients with partial dentures. You know, I never I never thought this this could be done effectively, but if you make a um, you know, you can you can make this over the patient's dentures, or you can make uh, if you have a full upper and full lower complete denture, you can actually make uh, an, an indentulous type of a bite splint that'll, with, a, with, with good retention and that will be, be functional and the patient can be comfortable with. And uh, same with partial dentures also. So it can be done and it is being done with partial or complete denture splints. So Okerson classified splints as muscle relaxant appliances, stabilization appliances used to reduce muscle activity. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at the Dawson classifications in a minute. And it's Okerson also said the anterior, there for the anterior repositioning appliances and orthopedic repositioning, repositioning appliances. And some of the other types are anterior, posterior biplanes, pivoting appliances, and soft and re resilient appliances of silicone. And you look at Dawson class classifications and they, they classified what I just talked about, the permissive splints or the muscle deprogrammer, the director splints or non-permissive splints, and the pseudo permissive splints that is soft splints and hydrostatic splints. And this is taken also from uh, Dr. Lennon Hess's uh, article in IDT Magazine, which is a great article. And you can, you know, if you want to check out this article, go online to Ages Communications and IDT. And this was done about a year ago and you can get the old, uh, they, they have the old um, uh, publications where you can pull it up online. But in this article, he talked about, he said permissive splints allow the unrestricted movement of the mandible against the appliance. And most splint therapies fall into this category. And directive splints direct the mandible into a predetermined position. And these splints of, uh, these types of appliances should be used with great caution and for only very limited periods of time, like I mentioned earlier. And permanent occlusal changes can occur with the use of improper direct splint therapy. So we have to be careful. An example of a directive splint would be an anterior positioning device that situates the mandible in a position that is anterior to the maximum intercrustation. And he elaborates more on his article, but this, I just took out some of the bullet points from his article to, to get across how important uh, to follow the guidelines of these permissive splints. And characterizations of these occlusal splints is stability, balance and centric relation, equal intensity stops on all the teeth, immediate posterior disclusion, and a smooth transition of lateral, protrusive, and extended lateral excursions, and also comfort during wear, reasonable aesthetics, and patient compliance. 
And these are just uh, some of the classifications in pain originating in a masticatory system structure. And we see, I touched on some of this before with TMG, TMJ pain and stretching of the retrodiscal tissues and collateral ligaments, capsulitis, synovitis. And then you have the muscular plane uh, amplified by both occlusal parafunctional and stress. And you have myofacial pain, which is referral pain, myositis, myospasm, local myalgia, my myofibrotic contracture. All these things have to be taken into consideration. And some of these are the effects that patients are, are experiencing. And we have, to, we have to diagnose and treat these types of classifications. So the function, we talked about this, to relax the muscles, to allow the condyle to seat in a musculoskeletal stable position, to provide diagnostic information. And what I mean by that, as you adjust these splints on a regular basis, it's providing you with more, more diagnostic information and protect those teeth and associated structures from bruxism. And also to mitigate periodontal ligament pre 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 preception and create cognitive, not cognitive awareness. And we talked about all this earlier, it's some of the application of exclusive splints. We talked about this in even in motor and sleep disorders and headaches and migraines, we can treat those types of, uh, types of problems. Also sleep bruxism, sleep apnea, Parkinson's disease and occlusal rehabilitation. I don't want, I just mentioned sleep apnea because there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, sleep appliances, but combination of uh, bruxism splints out there, you, uh, but you have to be careful, which I can't, I don't have time to get into that today, but uh, that's a whole other course. Uh, but I just, I wanted to put that in there. So now I want to get into some of the material choices. So we have a lot of cho choices and some of them I talked about earlier. And this is the Astron Clear Splint. This is the one I have. There's also a suction uh, uh, type of uh, splint, vacuum form splint uh, called Erk on an Ercodent machine. We have the Comfort HS material. We have the hard cured clear acrylic that's processed either heat cure or cold cure. Uh, and it's this cold cure material. I like the heat cure material. I like a little bit better because it's clearer. I feel like there's more uh, high impact resistance with the, with the heat cure material. Now I'm gonna talk about Versacryl in a little while. This is the material that I utilize when I have a hard acrylic splint, I remount the inside of that splint, I put this versicryl material, and it's a, so, kind of like a soft lining material and it softens up with the warmth of the mouth, but also makes it really comfortable for the patient. And there's something called light cured material called Primatech. And there's a lot of other materials on the market. We just don't have time to talk about everything tonight. And then there's Keysoft, which we talked about earlier uh, with the CAD CAM system. And they just came out with another material called Key Splint Hard, and it's a harder material. So the clear splint material, this is what I'm wearing now. And it's basically you mix a, a liquid and a powder and you can process it in a, in a pressure pot or in a curing unit. And this is the, the, this is the material right here. It's self-adjusting, great accuracy, the close, the, what, a good fit. It makes greater patient, greater patient comfort and reduces really uh, um, adjustments with cha in the chair time, reduces your chair time also, so which is great. And then they have the, uh, the clear splint now in CAD CAM uh, machine. So it comes in a puck form now and you can mill it in uh, any, any one of the mill milling machines out on the market, which is great. So, and then it's already in Europe. This is available soon in Europe too. It's already in Europe, but, uh, and then, uh, yeah, this just shows a, a milling machine and there's my mouth on top there with, uh, with the clear splint. And then there's the Ercodent. This is the Ercodent. This is an, another system that we utilize this quite a bit for hard, soft type of uh, uh, vacuum formed um, light splints. And what's great about this system, it has an articulator on it too. So you have an articulator on the system with the Ercodent you can incorporate into your um, design of your bite splint. And there's the vacuum form system right there. And it comes in many different thicknesses and different types of material also. And this is your Versacryl. So when you take a sip of water here. So this is the material I talked about earlier. And I utilize this with a lot of, with a lot of uh, different um, uh, functions and even with uh, implant cases and things like that and with denture, uh, denture cases. And basically it's, it's a material that comes with a hardener and a softener. So you can adjust the hardness or softness by mixing the two liquids together with this powder. You cannot, it's not advisable to utilize in the patient's mouth. So it must be lab, lab uh, cured and lab processed. And, uh, but it works great inside a bite splint, a hard bite splint, really works well. So, and there's a Primatech material here, as you see here, this material is, you know, it's hard to get this clear. It's a nice material, 
And you can see here, I blocked out the uh, undercuts of the tooth here, teeth here, and I duplicate the model. And all you do is apply this on to the model. When you put separate on the model, apply it to the model, and then you can close it down on an articulator, you can form it. You have plenty of time to work with this material. Then I put it in an electrode unit and cure it for, about, for anywhere from three to five minutes, which is great. And there it is. You can see it's not that, that clear. Um, and I also use this material for, for implant cases when I do verification indexes too, because there's no shrinkage and no expansion, which works out great. So this is the Primatech, uh, Primatech Primo Splint material. And it comes in a row form, so it's really easy to utilize. It comes in pink and, and uh, clear. And then there's acetyl resin. And I like acetyl resin. Acetyl resin is now being utilized uh, CAD -CAM, with uh, CAD CAM systems also. Uh, before you would have to uh, you know, wax it up, invest it, inject it, finish it, and polish it. And there was a lot involved. And I just wanted to show you know, this particular patient here, uh, she had worn down her teeth and she, she closed the bite significantly. And so uh, what was made was a, 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 an appliance similar to um, an occlusal splint, but more aesthetic. And this is the this is what we did here. It's just, so it's, it's, it was waxed. This particular one was waxed and injected, and it went over her natural teeth and opened her bite. And she was in a more comfortable position. And this way, they can get, we got her used to uh, this opening occlusally, and it really worked out well. And then uh, after this treatment was done, then we did some crown and bridge on on the on the patient and uh, raised a bite and made some new restorations. Pretty much was a full mouth reconstruction case. But you could see how close she was up on the upper left here. And you can see even that little craze line on number nine. I mean, she really, really used to close hard. It was a bad bruxer. And we raised her uh, to the amount of uh, opening that you see here on the lower right. And it worked out very well. This before, and this is after. And you can see it's pretty aesthetic. It's, you know, it's kind of a monolithic material, but it's, it, it you know, can be aesthetic. You can glaze it. You can, you know, you can, you can, you can characterize it if you want. Uh, but it is, it was a nice material. You know, so uh, we, we utilize this uh, at times when patients want more of an aesthetic look to it. And this can also be designed cat with CAD CAM system by scanning the model or scanning, uh, getting an intraoral impression and done in a laboratory by designing on three shape or exocat. And there's a final restoration. And then there's something called uh, Xerolux acetyl, which I just mentioned, which we can design uh, with uh, CAD CAM technology. It's the same material, only it's done with by milling, uh, milling the disc or puck. So let's talk about digital technology now. So you know, we come a long way with digital technology in all aspects of dentistry. You know, even with dentures. You know, with digital dentures are the hottest thing now. You know, I used to go to dental shows and see. You know, everything was about crown and bridge and, and uh, anterior restorations and uh, you know lithium disilicate and things like that. And now you see dentures and uh, digital dentures which is great we come so long it's an evolving technology and we're at this point now with digital technology we're able to design and make bite splints which is great and the software is great and you have virtual articulators where you can articulate these cases and go into different excursions and it really works out well so let's look at the advantages of digital versus traditional in the dental office well now with digital impressions there's no impression material necessary the bite registration can be scanned no gypsum is needed to pour the models. You have reduced material and labor costs and reduced chair time, which is great. And it's easy CAD technology. Digital impressions are emailed to the laboratory and many design options are available. Multiple, multiple software choices and a file is always available if the case is lost or, or broken. And just call us and say the patient lost their appliance, there's a dog, a dog ate the appliance, which happens a lot. And we can, we can make this for you in, in a really fast amount of time. So, which is great. And there's a lot of different printed material choices out there, even milled choices. So uh, with soft splints and hard splints. So how about the dental laboratory? Even for us, there's so, such great advantages on the digital side. I mentioned for the dental office, also with the laboratory, no models to pour. We have a virtual articulation now. It's a quick design of the splint. Printing time is much less than acrylic curing time. And have printed materials for soft and hard splints, no chips and no wax, no loop duplicating material, no acrylic. So it really, it really helps us out in the laboratory too with production. And uh, you know, it, it's just a lot of it, it's consistency and accuracy in the designs of these these appliances. The scan is accurate, you know, and most of the time we're getting digital scans from the dental office from you and the, the, the practitioner in the dental office. And the fit is precise. The file is stored and available for uh, for later if you need it. And the split can be designed with cuspid disclusion or anterior, anterior ramps. So I love where we're going here with digital technology. And let's look at the time comparisons too. 
uh, with that traditional versus digital. So, you know, when I used to du duplicate a model or, you know, for a model, four models duplicating uh, those models was about an hour and 45 minutes. And we look at the other aspects of making these appliances, waxing, flasking, packing, curing, finishing, polishing, it was about three hours and 30 minutes. And it's, so that's about five hours and 15 minutes to make an appliance. You know, of course we did a number at one time, but still it was a lot of time. And we look at the digital aspect of things here and we, we, we do things much quicker. You can design, nest and print in 55 minutes. And after that 55 minutes, we will take that and we'll post cure these, uh, we'll clean it, post cure it, finish and polish it, a total of 80 minutes compared to five hours and 15 minutes. It's amazing. And you have a nice accurate material. So let's talk about the different uh, types of uh, materials out there with the digital technology. Of course, with three shape, we we'll talk about a couple of, let's we'll talk about three shape, exit and there's other systems out there also. But we, what I like about this, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a virtual articulator and this virtual articulator is great because you know, it's a fully adjustable articulator and it can go into different excursions. And even with, you know, I have a lot of dentists taking, taking Facebook transfers, you can transfer that information to the software and, and we have our virtual articulator to help us adjust to the occlusion that you want to, want to get with the patient. Then we have our splint designs. There's many different designs with these splint designs too. Like I said, we can make a flat splint, anterior ramps, anterior guidance. We can have it thicker in one section than the other. You know, it's just, a, it's amazing. You know, how, you, know it, you can decide how many millimeters thick you want it. And this is the, with the uh, Exacad design here, you know, look at the different uh, uh, design options, you know? So uh, you can have the smoothing, the thickness, the diameter. Uh, it's just amazing what you can do with this, uh, this materials. So that's Exacad. Also, Exacad also has the virtual articulator, as you can see here. So a lot of the software systems offer the same thing. Some of them may offer some more modules than others, uh, but both of these systems are great. They work out well. And then there's a you know, number of different printers you can use. These are just, this is carbon and free shape uh, 120. There's the Envision Tech. There's so many other different uh, printers out there that you can utilize. Uh, there's one I just saw, which is called the Shining uh, printer. It's really nice. So we're, it's economical and it's, uh, it's carbon footprint is so small. You can put it on your desk at the, in your office there. So you have a lot of choices now and the prices are going down on a lot of these, which is great. So some of the design options here, you know, with key splint, I mentioned earlier, key splint is a great material and Jessica took can attest to that. Uh, and you have a lot of different uh, options now. now. Now we have key splint soft and key splint hard. Then you have the Panthera night guard, and this is done digitally also. And this Panthera night guard really works out well, it's popular and it is touted for the great comfort and more robust protection, even though it is the smallest flawless night guard on the market. So. This night guard is comprised of polyamide, which is a nylon-based material, kind of like uh, like a malplast material. So it's like it's a little bit stronger, you know. And the same 3D printer material is used in the fabrication of their Panthera DSAD sleep apnea appliances. And this medical grade material comes from durability, uh, durable rigidity on the occlusal surfaces. So for bad bruxes, it really works out well. And the comfortable flexibility of the buffle and lingual surfaces really enables the guard to engage the undercuts for better retention. Rather than have the ball clasp, as I showed before, and I mentioned this earlier, if I have a nice uh, undercut on a tooth and I have something that's going to give a little bit with a little bit of flexibility and snap into place and give me a snap fit, it's going to work out better. And this, you know, ball clasp, and you know, if you if you don't have the right design on ball clasp or any kind of clasp, it can really in, uh, encourage tooth movement. It acts like an orthodontic appliance, so you have to be careful. So this is why I like making appliances without clasps. So, and then you have again. Well, this is the um, the uh, key splint material here. It shows here. I'm going to show the different different uh, inside and out. The key splint material you can make it thicker. You get interior ramp, and it's biocompatible, transparent, polishable, stain resistant. Really easy to work with. And this is just showed shown after it's nested and uh, ready to be uh, ready to be uh, uh, post cured here. And it's easy to finish and polish too. So we just, if you, but most of the finishing is done, you know, if you design this correctly, there's really minimal finishing and polishing on these, this material. And I think I have a little video coming up here. I want to make sure this is, uh, so anyway, yeah, the procuring, uh, the, the uh, post curing machines, you, it's really important to get a good post curing unit because you don't want to have something that's not fully cured. So there's a lot of different ones out there. This is Sprint Ray. Uh, they have a couple of different other post curing units out on the market. You can spend anywhere from five hundred dollars to five thousand dollars. So uh, you want to make sure. But this is something that takes thirty minutes total in post curing. 
And this is the uh, Ubitron and Telerate. And this is also a push during it. It's a little bit more money, uh, but uh, uh, but it's just uh, it's something that's you know it really works well, and you need to have a good post curing unit. So I'm going to show you. Here we go. I want to just show you the flexibility of this material. Hopefully, everybody can see this. And no matter how you twist and turn this thing, it's going to go back to its original shape, which is great. Pretty cool. And again, you can design this any way you want, the thickness, ramps, whatever you need to do. But there you go, snaps right back on a model, even after twisting. So in conclusion, I just wanna mention a couple of things here. While occlusal splints are effect, uh, effective for managing things like teeth grinding and bite occlusions, it's important to note that they aren't necessary to permanent fix for them. That's where dentists may recommend additional treatments, which include the likes of orthodontics, Specialized dental work to adjust occlusion, like mentioned before, that with that woman, we had to make her uh, that one patient there. Uh, we had to make her crown a bridge to uh, open the bite, even after her, her treatment, or even surgery to ensure that individ individuals don't fall back into bad habits. For example, those wearing a repositioning splint, the bite may have changed as a result. However, failure to wear that splint will cause the bite to fall back into the same uneven alignment. So remember, the type of splint utilized is dependent on the diagnosis. A careful medical dental history along with a comprehensive examination is necessary for all patients, but especially those with facial pain, TMD, TMD and bruxism. And for specific diagnosis of TMD, the familiarity with application of splint therapy, therapy for patients with occlusal related disorders can be one approach to treatment of affected individuals. Proper diagnosis and fabrication of the appropriate device can often result in the relief of these symptoms. With that, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And I squeezed a lot of information into one one seminar here, so I hope uh, hope everybody got a lot out of it. There's a lot more to learn on this on these uh, types of appliances.